them and Deanne too about asking questions. So good evening and welcome to Telehealth 101, a healthy living series event presented by Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health. I'm Melissa Skarupa, your guide for the evening. Before we get started with the presentation, there are just a couple of housekeeping items that I'm going to go over. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the question and answer function. We will have about 30 minutes to answer your questions at the end of the program. At the end of the event, you will be sent a brief survey to the email address that you registered with. The survey will take approximately three minutes and will allow you to ask quest more questions and also helps us with future programming. We would be very grateful if you would fill the survey out within the next couple of days. Finally, on February 22nd, we are hosting another Healthy Living series on heart health. Please stay tuned for more information on how you or a loved one can register for that event. Now that that's taken care of, I'd like to introduce this evening's presenters. And this is live and I just scrolled down too far in my notes. So give me one moment. <laughs> Dr. Matthew Mackwood is primary care family physician at Dartmouth Hitchcock's Heater Road Clinic with over five years of telemedicine experience. Since starting at Dartmouth Hitchcock in 2018, Matt had supported innovation in primary care telehealth. With the COVID-19 pandemic, he supported rapid expansion of telemedicine video and telephone-based services. And after the first COVID-19 surge, began work and research in telehealth and telemedicine, as well as supporting Dartmouth Hitchcock Health's new virtual urgent care programming. When not juggling work duties, he is typically found chasing after his one and three-year-old kids, Willow and Langston, or minding the chickens on the homestead with his wife, Christina. He looks forward to getting back into playing ultimate Frisbee once the pandemic subsides. We also have Caitlin Darling joining us. She is a senior, senior practice manager in the Department of Connected Care at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. She has worked in healthcare for over 10 years, starting at Washington County Mental Health Services with the emergency screeners and at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center managing the Department of Gastroenterology. Caitlin has earned her green belt through the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Value Institute and has been a member of many research studies. Without further ado, Dr. Mackwood and Caitlin, take it away. Thanks very much. Uh, we're happy to have you all join us today. Uh, and thanks very much for the introductions, Melissa, as well. Uh, so uh, just a bit of a primer before we jump into walking through some of the meat and potatoes, so to speak, of how to go through a telemedicine visit. Uh, just to review some of the language around this, you may hear us use some terms interchangeably. Um, you may not hear it, you, you know, we may focus on certain terms over others, and this is kind of a little bit of background on why. Uh, often when we talk about telemedicine, you'll hear it talked about a couple different ways. Uh, telehealth is a broader term. So when you hear the word telehealth, sometimes people mean telemedicine, which is really that direct uh, equivalent to an office visit, basically, that you're having with a clinician. Uh, telehealth is a bit of a broader term, and that can include any kinds of exchange of information. So if you send a message to your provider, that's more of a telehealth kind of exchange rather than a telemedicine visit equivalent kind of exchange. We sometimes talk about outpatient virtual visits. Uh, there's a couple of different facets to telemedicine. Not all care happens in a clinic outpatient environment. Some care happens in an inpatient hospital environment. We use different language to talk about that. So when we say outpatient virtual visit, what we're talking about is basically a replacement for that face-to-face uh, -face visit, as I was just mentioning. Uh, when we use the word remote, you know, what we're talking about is that areas of the country, areas of this region, you can be relatively far removed from areas that are more populated. And of course, as we talk about Dartmouth-Hitchcock and Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health, uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health includes more than just the main hospital at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. Uh, so there's the main campus in Lebanon, you know, Alice Peck Day, New London Hospital, uh, Cheshire Medical Center, and we have a variety of community group practices throughout the southern part of the state as well. Um, Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health is really a broader uh, scope. So uh, hopefully this applies to all of you, regardless of where you're based as you're here at this talk today. So today we're just going to go through some of the objectives of our presentation. Um, we want to talk to you about education and why use telehealth at all. What kinds of appointments can you have via telehealth? What kind of technology do you need in order to have a successful visit? How should you prepare for your visit? What things should you bring and have ready? And then how do you know if telehealth is an option for you? You know, we know for some people it might not be a good option for them, but for a large majority of people, telehealth can be an option. 
And so talking about the big picture of uh, this whole sector, so to speak, uh, you know, we talk about healthcare as a pretty broad sector of the economy. Uh, telemedicine is an increasingly large share of that portion of, of the economy as well. So this is a list of what we call direct to consumer telehealth services, meaning uh, something where you as a patient directly interact with the clinician. Uh, and this is the volume of uh, procedures or visits um, that are being done in terms of money. So uh, that number on the left is in millions of dollars. So you can see year over year, uh, it's been kind of a slow and steady start, but especially um, in the last year, certainly with the pandemic, things have taken a big step forward. You can see that chart uh, extends past this year of 2021 into 22, 23, 24, 25. Uh, all expectations are as people get more used to this form of technology and this form of having care, that it will become an increasingly bigger part of how healthcare is done all over the country. And as we look at how telemedicine has grown at Dartmouth Hitchcock over the last couple of years, um, there's been you know, a steady outpatient virtual visit practice. From March 1st to March 17th, pre-COVID, we had 120 outpatient home visits. That was about nine per day. As you can see, once the state of emergency came on March 18th to March 31st, that's where we started to see an increase in our outpatient virtual visit volume. In April, in May, and June, everything took a steady, you know, raise in that number because the inpatient in-person services weren't really readily available because of social distancing. So as you see, the, the orange part is actually the telehealth visits that were done by phone and the blue part is the ones that were done by video. What we're really proud of is that in September, we developed this new platform that is much more efficient than our original platform. So you can see in September, the video visits started being more successful. So we really wanna to talk to you about that platform today and how easy it is to use and really encourage you to, to give it another shot, especially if you were somebody who started these visits back in April when we had a more of a clunky system, things have really improved since then. So we wanna you know, talk about that today. And so as you think about having a telemedicine visit, you know, one question you're probably asking yourself and that you might ask your doctor or your provider is why? Why would I use this service? You know, face-to-face -face care is good enough for me. Sure, there's this pandemic, but, you know, uh, probably this is the only thing I need to do when I can't be seen face-to-face. -face. And, you know, once we get back to normal, I won't need this anymore. And there's some reasons to think about using this even after the pandemic. So. Uh, certainly when we look at the world out there in terms of what we understand about telemedicine, there's really good literature to support this contention that if you are doing a telemedicine visit, you are saving time and energy. You know, you don't have to pay for gas. You don't have to take a big chunk of time out of your day, especially, you know, if you're coming to the medical center or somewhere that's sometimes a couple hours drive for people. Um, that's a pretty big cost, actually, to, to pay in addition to all the other costs associated with healthcare. When we talk about virtual visits, uh, obviously with the pandemic, it's been a huge boon. When we had our big lockdown, it was the only way really that we could continue to deliver care to people. We were doing a bit of limited face-to-face, -face, but uh, the vast majority of stuff, if it wasn't essential, uh, we were doing over telemedicine. And uh, you know, my experience in primary care is that you know, nine times out of ten, we were having complete successful visits, meeting people's needs via telemedicine. And as we talk about the larger world out there and what's known in telemedicine. Uh, we're continuing to understand the ways in which we can use this effectively. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in terms of what are some specific situations that might make sense. Uh, but a bottom line is always just to, if you think this might be an option for you to consider giving it a try, uh, to talk to your clinician about what makes sense for you. We do want to, you know, ensure everyone that this is a safe and secure option to have your healthcare needs. It's been used for decades. Um, it's safe, it's cost effective. It's a good way to attend your medical appointments. Um, there are the same privacy rules and regulations as in-person healthcare. And our technology is safe, secure, and HIPAA compliant. So nothing is ever recorded. I know, you know, a few months back, we had all of the concerns about the Zoom platform and people being able to break into it. And we want to assure you that we have the agreements in place 
that our system is secure so nobody can ever get in. There's um, you know, codes in the background to stop all of that from happening. So that is something that is um, you know, secure so that nobody can ever get into your, your visit and see any of your information. And so to walk through the process in a little bit more detail, uh, step one in having a telemedicine appointment is just how do you schedule it? And scheduling is pretty much the same as it would be for a face-to-face -face appointment. So uh, if you are someone who tends to call your clinic and ask, that's certainly a way you can do it. Um, some service lines and departments are offering the ability to schedule these visits online through the MyDH app. Um, the MyDH app is an important one to have for a variety of reasons for a video visit, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit as well. So there are some scheduling questions that you're going to be asked when booking your appointment, and we feel it's important that you, you know why these questions are asked. So it, it is required that providers have medical licensure and professional liability in the state where the patient is located during their visit, and those are requirements um, that, that are for every, every institution. For us at Dartmouth, we were lucky that during COVID, there was a lot of relaxed um, waived licensure requirements so that we were able to get deemed licensure in Vermont and emergency licenses in Massachusetts and Maine so that we were able to continue with that care. Um, but we like to let you know upfront that those are the reasons why we're asking those questions. There are also questions around internet connections and what kind of technology that you have because we want to ensure that you're going to have a successful visit at that time. So Matt's going to talk a little bit more now about those technology needs that we mentioned. So there are a variety of things that are helpful to have an appointment. Uh, essentially, if you have any kind of device that can connect to the internet, whether that be over Wi-Fi or cellular, uh, that has a camera and a microphone, you're able to connect. So uh, that includes something like a smartphone, uh, if you have a tablet, iPad, that sort of thing, uh, a laptop computer uh, or a regular computer, uh, again, just making sure you have the right peripherals. Uh, so the camera and microphone are really the two essential things. It's really valuable to have those attached ahead of time and test them. Uh, there is a way to test before your video visit if you go to the Zoom website. Um, so those are things you can kind of hook up and configure ahead of time. Uh, sometimes these are things that can seem pretty daunting to set up ahead of time, but uh, they're usually just a one-time thing in terms of most of that complexity is in the first time. So if you get somebody who's more familiar to help you, that may be really helpful to get that first setup done, get that first visit done, and then subsequent visits may be a lot simpler. In terms of what to think about in terms of connectivity and access, uh, internet access is essential. And what we really want to have a high quality video visit is a high quality internet connection. Uh, so when we talk about things that are less likely to be successful, that tends to include basically all cellular networks who are around here. I don't know that we have a lot of 5G uh, cellular network access yet, um, but that is coming in the future. Um, being in a home network, being on a Wi-Fi network can work reasonably well. Uh, ideally, you would be plugged in and wired to your home internet connection. Uh, that would be the best way to make sure that there's no interference, you know, something interfering with your Wi-Fi that would cause gaps in the cellular, or excuse me, gaps in the internet service that would cause gaps or delays in, you know, speaking or being understood. Um, and uh, those are all things that should be uh, important to think about, things that you might want to look ahead to. And we want to say, you know, if you don't have the right, right technology, it's okay. During the state of emergency, it is approved that we can do telephone appointments for patients that don't have those functionalities at home. The one thing that we did recommend pre-COVID was that there might be somewhere local that you could go to have your visit if you don't have that at home. So there might be a, a library in town that has a setup that you could use or there's also some option of some potential site visits that we might have um, equipment and contracts set up with. So if you don't have the right technology, it's, it's good to talk to them about what other options are available to me so that you can still have your telehealth appointment. And so I'll walk us through a little bit in more detail now about some of the particulars to set up. Uh, step one, all of you have already completed in the sense that you have the Zoom application. So congratulations on that. Yeah. 
that's an important platform. Basically the same way that you get on a Zoom visit, we use the same application, but with different encryption protocols. So healthcare specific privacy controls to have your telemedicine visit. Uh, the easiest way uh, in terms of having a smooth process of starting your visit, telemedicine visit, is to have the MyChart application. Uh, you can download that onto a smartphone or tablet. Uh, you can also sign into your account on a website. Uh, so those are all things that you may already have configured. If not, uh, you can certainly ask your clinics. Uh, they can help with setting that up with you. Uh, testing your Zoom setup. So. Uh, Visits like these are great to have a webinar, but uh, there's a URL that Zoom has, just zoom.us slash test. You can always Google that too, just like test my Zoom setup. And that will walk you through, okay, let's check your sound. And okay, does, can you hear this sound? And okay, let's check your microphone, speak into the microphone, and then we'll play it back to you. Can you hear what your microphone's saying? Uh, can you see yourself on this video? Uh, and that will let you know for sure that your peripherals, all the things that you need for your visit are working ahead of time. And we do have a website link that um, you'll, these slides will be made available, reference info will be made available. All of this is on the Dartmouth-Hitchcock uh, internal, or sorry, patient-facing website for you to look up as well. On the day of your visit, uh, it's important to know that you can't jump into your visit super early. Uh, we open up the video visit 30 minutes ahead of time, just so you have time. If you're a little bit ahead of time, we usually encourage you to jump on 10 to 15 minutes ahead of your visit time. That gives you a time to make sure everything is working on your end. You know, if the off chance your provider is running early, things can go really smoothly. Um, and that gives you the, the opportunity to connect with them. Uh, so to jump into your visit, you wanna sign into your MyDH account. So that's through the MyChart application I just mentioned. Um, so to open that up, the walkthrough varies a little bit depending on whether you're on a smartphone or a tablet. Um, it may look more like on that right side of the screen. If you're on a computer, uh, it may look more like the left side of the screen, but you'll need your login name and your password to sign into MyDH. Once you're in MyDH, you'll see a bunch of different options, but if you look relatively up at the top part, you'll have this opportunity to select your visits. Um, so you'll want to click on that button. It's highlighted on the screen that we're looking at together right now. And once you click on that, it will show you a variety of things. Usually if you've had some appointments already, it will show you past appointments. You can click on that for a visit summary and it should show you upcoming appointments as well. So you'd wanna find the specific visit that you have scheduled for that moment and you'll be selecting it to look at the details a little more closely. And once you've clicked on the details, you should see this screen here, which basically says that you're due to have a visit with whoever your provider is and it will give you a prompt that says it's time to start your video visit. You see that large green button there, and that's really your link to click to open Zoom. It will automatically go from this link to open a web page. The web page will then open the Zoom application for you, and the Zoom will have everything pre-configured to connect you just with your care provider for your appointment in that span of time. And this is looking at a little more detail at what that will look like. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about troubleshooting, but usually you will get this kind of pop-up window and the pop-up window will just double check. Uh, if you've never run Zoom before, it will give you this window. Sometimes if you use Zoom frequently or have checked this box before that says always allow, you may not get this pop-up screen, uh, but that'll be something to look for from your internet browser, which will then speak to Zoom and give it all the information it needs. Before your visit starts itself, meaning before your provider has arrived, you will get this kind of waiting room screen. Uh, so on the right side here, you can see that little circle with the sentence, please wait for the host to start this meeting. It gives you another chance to test your setup if you feel like you need to do that. And then once the provider arrives, it should give you a prompt to join the meeting, look at your video and do that kind of thing. Oh, Katie, you're muted. So you might be wondering, what do I do if I don't have a MyDH account? It's okay, you can still have a telehealth visit. However, we do really encourage you to get a MyDH account for these virtual visits. It really makes the process a lot smoother because you can go into your chart and start the visit when you're ready. Without having the MyDH account, um, as we said, you can still have the visit, but a, a link has to be manually sent to you. Sometimes that's sent the day of scheduling, sometimes it's sent the day prior or 20 minutes ahead of your visit. Each section is a little bit different with how they decide to send that link to you. Um, when you're scheduling, the scheduler is 
and then they're going to update that in the chart so that it's um, available for for them to send it to you. Um, so again, it, it is available that way, but we do really encourage you to to get that MyDH account. So there are some common issues that we have found with these visits that we want to talk a little bit about. So the first one is that Zoom isn't launching. So sometimes you'll go into that start my visit and Zoom just doesn't launch for some reason. The error is usually due to pop-up blockers. So we do have this helpful tip and trick on how to disable pop-up blockers for Chrome, Firefox, Edge, Internet Explorer, all of the different ways you might be trying to use your visit. We do have that um, up on our internet page, which is right here. That again will be sent to you. So that's if you hit start and nothing happens. The other thing that might happen is that Zoom will ask you for a password. This usually happens if you have not downloaded Zoom prior to your visit. So what happens is you go to launch that visit and it's gonna ask you, do you wanna download Zoom? When you say yes, download Zoom, after it downloads, Zoom doesn't remember where it's supposed to go and what it's supposed to be doing. So it thinks it needs a password to join a meeting. But really all you have to do is close it hit join meeting again, and then Zoom's gonna recognize, oh yes, you were trying to get into your virtual visit, here we go. Um, so that's another common issue. And then we always have this patient support line available. It's an 888 number that if you run into any issues that you can't you know, solve on your own, we just encourage you to call and they can walk you through any, any potential issues that you're having. So one of the questions that comes up a lot is around if your insurance is gonna cover a telemedicine visit. So luckily during COVID, there were a lot of special waivers that came out expanding telehealth coverage. So under usual circumstances, Medicare, New Hampshire, Vermont Medicaid, and most commercial payers do cover many telehealth services. Uh, Pre-COVID, the one area that we did have a lot of difficulty in was with Medicare. There were some restrictions to where you lived in eligible locations. So pre-COVID, Medicare wasn't paying for telemedicine visits to home. Our hope is that post-COVID, this uh, will be a covered service and we think it's headed that way. But those are some of the things that we, we have to look at and manage behind the scenes. We do have some really great scheduling processes in place and scheduling trees so that as a scheduler is booking you, it pops up to let them know what insurance you have to know if you're covered for the visit or not. But we do recommend that when you have additional questions about it or you want to ensure that you are going to be covered, that you do reach out to your insurance company and just verify that with them. And so to segue a little bit from the logistics of doing a visit to kind of the what and why, uh, I wanted to speak just briefly about what kinds of things have we found have been helpful to do over telemedicine. Uh, by and large, if you are seeing somebody you've already seen before for a problem that they've already examined you for, they've done some testing, they've done some evaluation, uh, frequently that is something where a telemedicine visit is reasonable. Uh, Oftentimes, just talking about how you're doing, reviewing the data that's been collected so far, um, you know, if you're adjusting a medication dose or something like that, those are things where usually the exam is not going to tilt the scales in terms of needing to listen to a heart or lung or things like that. Um, so those are always really good cases to think about. Maybe I could have this as a telemedicine visit. Uh, issues that don't need a hands-on exam in general uh, can always be seen uh, for first visits even. So, you know, mental health concerns are a really good example of this. Our psychiatry department is still doing the overwhelming majority of their visits purely via telemedicine uh, because so little of what they do requires the hands-on approach. Obviously, it's nice to have that face-to-face -face interaction, and that's still a choice you can make by and large in a lot of situations, but do consider that uh, it may not be 100% necessary for your clinician to make that decision. And this includes things where you often might think, gosh, it would be helpful to have someone examine me. You know, a cough or a cold type of issue, particularly with COVID in the picture right now, it can take a lot uh, of setup to get someone evaluated for those kinds of conditions. Uh, often in our clinical experience, you know, I see coughs and colds on a very routine basis. I can tell a lot uh, very accurately just from the story of your symptoms, from looking at you a little bit, and just hearing about the course of how things have developed. Generally speaking, a cold develops very differently from a pneumonia. Uh, 
in cases where we're not sure, sometimes the exam is not going to be necessary either, where I might say, gosh, maybe we should just do an x-ray uh, and save you the trouble of coming into clinic for a visit in addition to doing an x-ray. Um, so sometimes we can actually be a little bit creative in terms of how we use imaging studies or lab tests uh, to work around the, the limitations of a telemedicine encounter. And really a bottom line, I would just, again, really encourage you to talk to your provider team. If it's really a big hassle for you to come in, please do not feel like you got to schlep in just on our account um, so we can feel like we're doing everything perfect. Uh, we can do a lot. Like I said, you know, nine times out of 10, we're finding in primary care, we're able to meet everyone's needs that we're seeing via telemedicine in the way we see them. They won't necessarily need a short-term follow-up visit or other kinds of needs. That will vary a bit by problem and by department but do check with your providers. It's often more than you think. So if you go to the next slide, Katie. Uh, so thinking about preparing for your appointment, what things will help you have a successful visit? Some of these things are universal, whether it's face-to-face -face or telemedicine, I always recommend having a list prepared ahead of time. What topics do I wanna make sure I address with my provider today? What questions do I have? What are those things I wanna leave the visit having had answered? If you can put that out there at the start of the visit, it's a good bet you'll get it addressed. If you're doing the visit from home or otherwise have the opportunity to use different tools that can measure your vital signs, that is always helpful for us. These are things we do routinely for every patient that comes in. And that includes things like checking your height and weight, taking a temperature, taking a blood pressure, taking a pulse. Uh, depending on the issue, you don't necessarily have to go out of your way to check those things. We would let you know if it's essential information. Uh, but if it's convenient for you to do, if you happen to have a machine at home, you know, if your work has something you can check on before, beforehand, uh, it's really helpful just to let your provider know at the time of your visit. Having your medications close at hand is really useful too. Uh, oftentimes it's actually more accurate for us to do this over telemedicine. When people come into clinic, they kind of have to remember what their medicines are. But if you're literally holding up your bottles and saying, yes, I'm taking this, we can actually be extra accurate in making sure your medication list is up to date and that we're meeting your needs. And finally, you know, if you're thinking of inviting someone to the visit, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the logistics of that as well, but uh, you wanna have some form of contact information for that person. Often you can text them the information or email them the information to invite them into your video visit. Uh, so you'd want to have that handy so once you join the visit with the provider, you can quickly invite that person. And so in terms of inviting someone to join the visit, uh, this is something that hopefully you can see at least a facsimile of this in our uh, Zoom encounter right now. Uh, at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom visit, you should be able to see a participants list. If you click on that button with the two little people, you should then see a screen on the right side uh, that has a button at the bottom that says invite. Uh, I hope that's true of the webinar format. If not, you can certainly uh, replicate this in other situations on Zoom on your own time. And so before Katie continues, I just have to address a call. Uh, I'm gonna turn my video off for a moment, but I hope to be back as soon as I can. All right, so if you guys might have noticed the slides turn to Telehealth 101 instead of Telemedicine 101, as we learned in the beginning, telemedicine was more the practice of medicine and telehealth was more that broader. So I'm gonna give you an example right now of a telehealth um, platform that we have. So outside of our outpatient virtual visits, we do have a host of other telemedicine services. One of those is being our family connections program. So this is a program that we established in the beginning of COVID where we had a lot of inpatients that were admitted to the hospital and they didn't have any way to communicate with their family. So they didn't have you know, their Facebook or Messenger or any of those things. So we created this um, platform that is on an iPad that you can log into it and quickly start a meeting and send a link to a family member. So we wanna let you know about this functionality in case you do have somebody admitted to the hospital that you wanna be able to communicate with via video that that opportunity is available. I also wanna talk about a couple of our other acute care service lines that we have at regional hospitals around us. And this is, if you were to show up at one of those hospitals, hopefully you never have to, but if that was the case, we do have a lot of services set up. So I think it's just good to quickly, you know, briefly let you know about those in case you ever encounter them. So 
Our acute care services are set up at inpatient hospitals and in EDs. They're all board certified specialists that work virtually alongside the bedside team to evaluate and recommend treatment plans. The main thing that you should know is that, you know, protecting your privacy is important to us. The video connection for all of these services is HIPAA compliant. Your evaluations won't be recorded and all of your medical records are housed in that hospital where you were being seen. So our teleneurology and telepsychiatry program that we have available in local EDs and inpatient floors is a program set up where the neurologist and psychiatrist can connect with you and your bedside team via real-time two-way audio-visual connection. And that is done with this HIPAA compliant telemedicine cart that is um, with a video conferencing software. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the cart that we actually use for this ser service. It zooms in and out very well. The providers are able to come on and really act as if they are your bedside team. So the specialists connect and they'll conduct their evaluation using the audio visual connection. They'll provide treatment recommendations to your bedside team. And then the bedside team is the one who is gonna carry out those recommendation and treatment plan and do any follow-up work with you that's necessary. We really have this service out there because there are limited resources in some of the you know, small, the rural hospitals. So we wanna be able to help, um, you know, back them up with the support they need. Another service that we have is our tele-emergency service line. So our tele-emergency allows the local team to focus on the patient care and the providers and the nursing staff are able to stay at the bedside without interruption, assisting the team with the consult, any medication doses, helping to document so that your staff isn't having to leave the care of the patient to go back and do their documentation. They can help with any codes and treatment recommendations. Um, they're also available for unusual and rare cases that might not usually, you know, come up in those emergency rooms as often as they might come up at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. So they're able to kind of help, help them with some of those. As you can see in the picture for our tele-emergency equipment, they actually have a, uh, a monitor that's mounted to the wall so that it's very easy when an emergency comes in, they just hit an emergency button on the wall and they're automatically connected to our ED physicians. Another service line that we have is our tele-ICU service line. So it allows experienced critical care nurses and physicians to continuously monitor your condition using video equipment that is located right in the patient room. So this equipment actually provides analytics that can predict uh, patient you know, declines and gather that information so that they can actually alert staff and help with interventions prior to any adverse events happening. So it's really, it's really neat to see it set up. So as you can see, Dr. Surgeoner, our tele-ICU medical director is in the screen here. And that is the system that they have where they have the monitors that they can act proactively be watching vitals and everything for the patients. So again, you know, for both of these services, we wanna remind you that it doesn't replace your bedside team. It's really just another set of eyes to help that bedside team with the patient. And then our last um, acute care service line that we have is our tele-ICN service line. So this service line is actually used with a tablet so that it's easy to maneuver in and out of the patient's room, especially when you're, you know, with neonates, it's easy because there's small spaces. Um, so they'll connect with you and your bedside team via the iPad. They'll conduct the evaluation. Um, do any treatment recommendations, and then they can stay online, you know, if a transport's needed to really help that bedside team. Um, so those are our service lines. Again, hopefully nobody ever has to use them, but those are options out there in the area for ways that we're helping to support our community and critical access hospitals. And so just to sum up, uh, all of these slides will be available for reference and the recording will be available as well. But in terms of thinking about telehealth, you know, call your provider's office. Ask them if you have any kind of healthcare need, is this something that could be done via telemedicine? You know, could we have a phone or a video visit and meet my needs? When you have your visit, make sure you have things at hand, have your medications at hand, have the tools to take your vitals, you know, make sure you're prepared for those visits like you would be for a face-to-face -face encounter. 
And really importantly, uh, test your connection ahead of time. Like I said, that first time can always feel so daunting. Uh, often, particularly in the era of COVID, many people around you may be more familiar with this. Uh, it's totally fine to ask for help. And usually after you get that first time figured out, that first time off the ground, you test it, it works well. The second time is much smoother. Uh, and we have supports available. Uh, I believe Katie will emphasize a little bit around that as well. But it's a learning curve, you know. Uh, us providing the care have had a learning curve. You know, the way we provided care in March and April uh, looks a little bit different than the way we've provided it now as we've come to learn over repetition and with time what works well, what doesn't. Um, so I think you'll have a pretty pleasant experience and that's the feedback we've gotten from our patients as well. And our last slide is just a resource page. So we'll make sure that this gets sent out to everyone. As we mentioned, um, all of these links are embedded throughout the presentation, but I thought it would just be nice to have one uh, slide that you can go to for all of those resources at once. So we'll make sure that this gets sent out um, individually as well. So I think now we'd love to open it up for questions, um, any feedback, if anyone's had a telemedicine visit, how's it gone, um, anything you wanna Talk about. So if you'd like to ask some questions, just one just popped up, put them in the question um, box down there and we will get to those questions. Let me just look here. Can I, can I get a new refill, a new or refill prescription with telehealth appointment? That is a great question. The answer is yes. Uh, and that actually has had some extra flexibility with the public health emergency and waiver. Uh, it's actually possible now to do a telemedicine visit with a new provider to establish care. Um, so if on the off chance you're changing situations, uh, you need to establish with a new provider, it is possible to have a telemedicine visit, meet and get to know them, and get your prescription refilled all at the same visit. That's a great use case. Thank you. Um, we just had another one come in. What happens if I schedule a telehealth video appointment, but the connection doesn't work? So that, that happens quite often. You know, you might have a dead zone or something happens. If that's the case, it's okay to proceed as a telephone visit. You know, during COVID, that is still an option that those are being covered. So we can do it as a, telemed as a telephone visit for that encounter. Thank you. Um, the next one is, what is the availability of telehealth schedule um, wise? Because I want to establish with a provider and the earliest appointment is July. This is a great question. It really varies. Uh, I can say for our primary care side at Heater Road, uh, generally speaking, if you want to see somebody, a telemedicine visit is usually available sooner than a face-to-face -face appointment. So it's worth asking. Um, but it really depends on the provider. It depends on the situation. You know, if the person you're thinking of establishing with is a specialty provider, you know, they may have times where they work in the hospital and are just generally unavailable for care. Um, many specialty clinics have wait lists. Many clinics have wait lists. Um, so it's worth talking to them about that as well. And, you know, specifically asking, can I get on a wait list for a telemedicine appointment? Sometimes they're separate wait lists. It can be a really smart question to ask. Um, July is a really long time, so I, I wonder if there isn't something else going on. I'm sorry your wait is so long. Yeah, and it might be, like you said, the access, you know, for that particular provider. You know, I actually had a telehealth visit a few months ago um, with my current provider, and, and it was made within a week. And um, in my instance, it was great because I was just having some symptoms of tiredness. And so often you'll go in and um, and you'll have that initial appointment, probably have to do some blood work and then have another appointment. So it's exactly what happened, but I was able to do it you know, from my home right here and, um, and do that, do the blood work and then talk, come back, you know, to find out my vitamin D level is low because we live in New England. And <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but it did make it so much easier to do that. But, um, but that was with my established provider. We just had another question come in. Are these telehealth appointments um, forced? I tend to prefer in-person appointments, albeit I understand that some times telehealth can um, have its benefits. So, um, so are these kind of being required, I think, is, is the question. I don't know, Katie, would you like to start? 
Yeah, so they're they're definitely not being required. I think um, when when COVID first started, it was turning into something that was required because we had to avoid the in person. So a lot of sections were saying telehealth is our only option. Right now, we're slowly bringing people back into clinic, but we're also being very careful of the social distancing. So a lot of sections are really trying to use telemedicine the best they can to still keep that social distancing. There are a few sections that I've talked to that says we're, we're offering telehealth, but if we get a lot of pushback, then we'll go to in-person, but that's really just because their clinic areas are so small. So I think it's, it's definitely not something that is being forced um, onto anyone. It's just something that we're really trying to push in order to help us kind of through this time. Yeah, we've worked really hard ever since the lockdown when it was forced to figure out how can we meet people's needs best? And, uh, you know, oftentimes face to face is what people need or what people want. You know, clinically, there may be equivalent ways we can do care, telemedicine, or face to face, but there is something about that face to face interaction that has value. Uh, you know, it's debatable, I think, if face to face like this versus face to face like this has more value. Um, so you might want to consider actually, sometimes you can get more personal connection this way without masks. Um, but as far as I'm aware, I haven't seen that being forced in any scenarios, but there are definitely times where we would recommend it. Thank you. And um, the next question is, how long is a typical appointment? I'm always worried about being feeling rushed in my appointments. I'll let you take that, Matt. You're yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, in a big picture sense, all of this varies depending on who you're seeing, what department they work in, and what their normal policies are around this stuff. Um, from the primary care side, you know, uh, we basically allot the same amount of time for a telemedicine visit as we would for a face-to-face -face visit. Um, if anything, honestly, when I do my telemedicine days, I feel like I'm less rushed. I don't have to run from room to room. I have fewer people coming and interrupting me between patients. Uh, you know, I don't have to run and find supplies to do the various things I do in my face-to-face -face encounters. So I honestly tend to run generally more on time. I'm often about 15 minutes late when I'm face-to-face -face, and I'm usually about five minutes early with my telemedicine schedule. Um, so it can vary, uh, but in general, I would not expect that to be a, you know, compromised or forced or rushed kind of encounter compared to the usual equivalent. Just to follow up on that, do you, um, is there usually kind of a, a nurse or a medical assistant that screens prior to hopping on? Because I know usually that's part of your appointment when you go into um, a clinic or a hospital. That's a great question too. So within our primary care department, we do work to make sure everyone gets at least an outreach from our medical assistants. We try to call ahead of time, check vital signs, check in with your medication lists, all the routine things we'd like to do for a regular visit. Uh, it's not always possible. We're having a lot of challenges across the organization uh, in terms of people, uh, staffing. You know, people have needs with the COVID pandemic. People are calling out. Um, it's not always possible to get that sort of ahead free contact. Um, but di again, different departments are doing this differently. In some places, uh, it may be at the time of your visit, you may see the MA kind of before the provider hops on the video call. Um, you know, in other departments, it may be something when you schedule the visit, they would ask you some of those questions, or they may send you something on MyDH ahead of time to fill out as a questionnaire. Um, so it really will vary. And it's worthwhile to, you know, reach out to your provider ahead of time, if you have anything you want to make sure they're aware of before your visit. Thank you. Um, can new patients be seen by telemedicine? Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of, and I'll let, I'll let Matt speak to it in the primary care area, but I think in a lot of specialty areas, what we're actually hearing is that it's extremely beneficial to see new patients via telehealth because a lot of times they don't have the labs or the testing that they might need done. So it's good to have that conversation with them, talk to them about the symptoms, make recommendations about testing so that if and when they do come into the clinic, you really have all that information you need for a full you know, diagnosis and treatment plan for the patient. So we're finding huge benefit in the specialty areas, but Matt, what are you seeing in the primary care area? Yeah, uh, you know, more or less, it's been about the same as we see with face-to-face -face in terms of how many people are coming in for new patient visits. You know, when I'd reviewed the data for our clinic, um, there wasn't really any big difference in terms of who was coming in and um, the need for follow-up. So with the emergency waiver that we have, it is possible for you to establish care as a new patient. Uh, it's not clear if that will continue after the uh, emergency waiver expires. Like a lot of the other things we've talked about, we hope that it will. 
Um, but please stay tuned on those fronts as things change. Thank you. Um, we have one more question that just came in. In the past, I was able to occasionally email my PCP non-urgent medical questions through the MyDH portal without it being billed. Is this still an option or have the telehealth virtual visits replaced that? It's a good question. This is an interesting space right now um, in terms of how policy informs payment and how we deliver care. The outpatient virtual visit, the opportunity to have a face-to-face -face video or phone-based call in real time with the provider pretty nicely maps to the equivalent of a face-to-face -face visit. There is an emerging continuing conversation in the healthcare space uh, from providers to payers basically saying, this is a lot of work. You know, when we spend 10, 15 minutes on an email back and forth with the patient, that is equivalent in some ways to the time I would be spending on a face-to-face -face visit, but I'm not able to bill for that. I'm not getting paid at the same way. And as a byproduct of that, these things tend to get less emphasis. So, you know, your provider may be slow to respond. Uh, there may be barriers in how they're able to do that because there are financial factors around that. So uh, it's hard to predict which way the wind is blowing on that. Uh, things may change in the future about how things are structured, how you get in contact with your team, how it's paid for. You know, my hope is that there wouldn't be a big out-of-pocket cost to a patient around that, but that insurances would recognize the value and pay for it as sort of a wraparound part of your care experience when you engage with any team. Is it less costly to have telehealth versus in-person? So I think, you know, billing wise for the actual visit, it is the same CPT code that we're using. It gets billed the same way to insurance. However, where it's less costly is that you can just do it, you know, take 20 minutes out of your day to have your virtual visit instead of taking the day off work, the costs associated with traveling to the hospital, getting to your appointment, um, checking in and all of those things. So where we really see the savings for patients is in your personal time and not having to take that, that time off work. One thing I'll add to that as well, like everything else, the caveat is that this is under the emergency waiver for the COVID-19 pandemic. Pre-pandemic, there were some restrictions on what could be done and the payment for it. Uh, it was a less robust option in some ways and the payment reflected that. There's an active discussion in a lot of policy circles about uh, how much can uh, we do over telemedicine? Is that truly equivalent in terms of what we should be paying in terms of the insurers, in terms of Medicare, in terms of those things? Um, so that is another thing that may shift. And um, I'm concerned actually that, you know, uh, too much cost cutting there may mean we stop offering, you know, we as healthcare um, because it becomes less profitable and doesn't make sense from a financial incentives perspective. Um, so there's a lot of balancing points there. I hate to talk about money on the forum like this, um, but you know, my hope is that uh, we'll be able to offer it in some form going forward. It's really hard to say exactly how the cost side of that equation is going to play out. And it's clearly, you know, it's evident that especially in rural areas that this mm -hmm. is a um, huge benefit because some people are traveling an hour plus to get their, their medical care. Um, what is the balance that you've seen? Have you seen a, a pretty you know, good balance um, across the pa patient population, um, you know, rural areas versus urban areas. And I, I guess it's hard because it could be skewed right now with COVID and people um, doing this because it just makes sense right now for them to, to do, the, do the appointment from home. I don't know, Katie, if you wanna weigh in from there. Yeah, so I think it is a little bit hard right now during COVID because a lot of people are doing it regardless, but there's been a lot of uh, research studies actually completed in the past, especially with um, looking at how telemedicine can influence patients from outside of our region. So, you know, instead of just looking at New Hampshire and Vermont, we've been able to reach into Mass uh, Maine and other areas to avoid that travel. So I think that we do see a large majority of our telemedicine visits kind of pre-COVID being from those further, further away areas where it is more difficult to travel here. Um, but during this time, I think it is, has been kind of difficult to figure out, you know, the, the majority just because it's, it's one of the main options right now. 
Yeah, it does provide some interesting opportunities. You know, what I love in primary care is, you know, if I have a patient who sees me semi-regularly, but, you know, part of the year they're pretty far away, you know, they go to Maine for their holiday or whatnot, they can still have a visit with me right now. Um, there's a lot of state licensing. There's a lot of regulations. It's kind of <laughs> what I keep coming back to with this. Um, so it's not possible to do that in all cases, but uh, for a lot of people, yeah, it's really valuable to save them the trip. Um, but, you know, I see people in Lebanon, you know, people just down the street from here are choosing to do telemedicine visits as well. Um, you know, it really covers demographics. It really covers a lot of geography. Um, the biggest difference I probably see is in who uses video versus phone uh, in the sense of people who don't have good broadband are using phone. And that's um, been really helpful uh, for a lot of those people who have trouble getting into care. I hadn't thought of that, the traveling. So if you are going somewhere, you know, um, we, we go up to rural Maine at times. So that is a good option if you needed yeah. it or a child needed it. I'm of a mind we should all get licensed to work in, you know, Arizona and Florida for all of our patients who travel for the winter. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. Um, so a, a question just came in. What is the current expiration date of the emergency order? So that is almost changing on a weekly basis. <laughs> it keeps getting, luckily for us, it keeps getting pushed back. Um, so I think, you know, we've got at least two or three more months now. And I think that they're still talking about even after the emergency order is done, still allowing a lot of these things to happen for at least three months after. So we're not in a position where we're super worried about anything yet. I think in the next um, few months, and especially after you know the a lot of the vaccines have gone through, I think we'll start getting some more uh, real information on when that expiration is really going to happen. Yeah, I agree. I don't foresee any sudden shifts in this. You know, the pandemic will subside. Uh, it will probably do so slowly. Uh, those of us doing this kind of work are so heavily invested. We've been letting the people making the policies know that. Um, I, I have every expectation there will be a thoughtful approach to how do we transition out of this without leaving people in the lurch. Thank you. Um, and feel free to add any other questions. I have one final question for right now, but we'll answer certainly any others that, that come in. Um, can this be used for kind of the pre-op um, appointments? If somebody is, you know, coming in, can this be used for pre, pre-op? Great question. We had a lot of, I'd say, healthy discussion about this in primary care at the start of the pandemic. And um, our consensus was for the vast majority of people, yes. You know, uh, the point of the preoperative appointment by and large is to look through your health history, look at what your risk factors are for something to go awry with your surgery, which generally boils down to, do you have a serious heart condition or some other kind of organ that would be threatened if you had a sudden blood loss in surgery, if you had to go under anesthesia? Those are usually things we can figure out by talking to you. On the off chance that we did need to investigate something, uh, as I was mentioning before, often that is something like, you know, an ultrasound of the heart or an x-ray or something that you don't need to come into the clinic to see a clinician to get done. Uh, there is the occasional person where we would want to listen to you and um, odds are pretty good if that's the case, you will kind of have a sense already that you might be someone who needs to be seen. Um, but we would certainly let you know and make arrangements to, to do that. If you're getting cataracts, you never need to be seen. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, well, I think That's that is all we have for the questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, all that we have for the questions right now, let me just see if one popped up. Oh, one more just popped up. What if I need an interpreter for my appointment? So right, so, go ahead. We have it set up right now um, so that we have two options to add interpreter services to the appointment. One is going to be if the provider is in the clinic, then the interpreter can still come to clinic with the provider. The other option is that the provider can call the interpreter and have them on speakerphone and the patient on video through their um, computer and have the connection that way. We're actually in the process of building a new platform, which we hope to go live with pretty soon, where as Matt was showing you the invite feature for the Zoom meeting, what the providers can actually do is hit that invite and then there'll be a list of contacts of different interpreter services that they can you know, double click and have joined their meeting almost instantly so that they're available. So we're excited for that new development within our outpatient virtual visit practice to have it readily available and not have to worry about 
you know, getting it all set up ahead of time. Well, thank you. I think that was that was the last question for the evening. Do you have anything to to add, Dr. Mackwood or Caitlin? Appreciate everyone's time and energy and interest in this. Um, as I've alluded to several times, it is a moving target, uh, but we've been doing this for quite a while now. And I'm really encouraged by the work everyone is putting in on all sides. You know, your care teams, uh, you know, the patients who've done this work and have given us feedback. Uh, we've made tremendous strides. And uh, I really do believe that we'll have a role for telemedicine even once the pandemic goes away to provide convenient access to care. And in some cases, you know, maybe even better access to care for people in need. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to give it a try if you haven't yet and to keep an open mind. Yeah. And I just thank you all for the opportunity. Really excited to see where, you know, telehealth is going now and in the future. So appreciate your time. And if you have any other questions, you know, that pop up after you sign off here, um, like I said, at the beginning, you'll be receiving a survey um, that's sent to the email that you're registered on. And you're welcome to ask any other questions and we'll get a hold of Caitlin and Dr. Mackwood um, to get the answers for you. So thank you for joining us.